woman tests positive for arsenic poisoning just in time to save her life. But others before her weren't so fortunate. Now investigators must build a case on cremated remains. Doctors watch helplessly as a man wastes away and dies. Detectives diagnose it as murder. And unless they can stop it, it may be going around. A young woman is killed in a tragic riding accident. But a series of subtle clues leads investigators to believe that this tragedy was really no accident. Most victims are poisoned by someone they trust done in by a fatal lapse of judgment, but it only takes investigators a whisper of suspicion to detect a taste of poison. In March of 1988, in the rural town of San Angelo, Texas, paramedics responded to a call at the home of Lita and Algie Nobles. Lita told the paramedics that she and Algie had both been suffering from a stomach flu. Algie had refused to go to the hospital. Three days after the onset of his symptoms, Lita found Algie unconscious. Paramedics pronounced him dead. Lita Nobles had been nursing her sick husband for months. He'd been in a car accident that should have claimed his life. With a shattered jaw, he could only eat baby food. About time. What kind of garbage is this? Eh? Algie's convalescence was far from yeah. peaceful. Yeah. Just wait yeah. you're complaining. You're always complaining about it. He and Lita what fought like what cats and dogs. Mean? All the time. Well, you just don't know what it's like. Emma. Despite the tension, he seemed to be making a swift recovery. Lita wasn't faring as well. The stress of tending to her quarrelsome husband aggravated her ulcers. She lived on antacids. Two months after Algie's death, a close friend, Tim Scoggin, brought Lita to the hospital. She complained of extreme fatigue, vomiting, and stomach pains. She had lost a large amount of blood. Doctors believed an ulcer was to blame, but treatment didn't improve her condition. Weeks passed. Her condition worsened. Then her hands and feet became paralyzed. Looking for a cause, doctors ran a battery of tests including a screen for heavy metal poisoning. I think what we're going to have to wait for is that blood test to come back. And a urinalysis came back positive. Lita Nobles had arsenic in her body. The Texas Rangers were contacted. Investigator George Frazier's first job was to eliminate environmental contamination as the source of the toxin. When we first started the investigation, all that we knew was that there was presence of arsenic in the body of Lita Nobles. So in the process of elimination, to find out where she got this poison, we tested her water well. Her house was on a water well. Arsenic is a poisonous metal found naturally in the earth. Because it is an element, it can't break down. But its atoms can combine to form other compounds. A little arsenic has a lot of killing power. In rural Texas, it was once used as a cotton defoliant. Through runoff, it could contaminate a water supply. Samples from the noble's home were taken and tested. The well was clean. Investigators questioned Lita's brother and sister-in-law who stayed at the house after Algie's death. Neither of them suffered any symptoms, even though they had eaten all of their meals there. 
And yet, during that time, Lita grew progressively sicker, suggesting she'd been repeatedly exposed to the arsenic. As investigators eliminated every possible source of accidental contamination, they came to one grim conclusion. Lita Nobles hadn't been randomly poisoned. She had been targeted for murder. Someone wanted her to die. Are you using Investigators kind of questioned her about who might want her dead. Well, nothing to speak of except what's out in the garage, insecticides and things like that. She pointed the finger at her deceased husband. Our first suspect in Lita's poisoning was Algie uh, because she felt like they, they were an older couple and they had a lot of times that they just quarreled and, and uh, bit at each other, seemed like, all the time. And uh, she first told us that if she had been poisoned, he did it. And so we had to eliminate him as a suspect even though he was already dead. To find out whether Algie had had a hand in his wife's illness, detectives needed to know whether she'd been poisoned before or after his death. The victim's hair, they believed, would answer that question. Arsenic stays in hair and fingernails long after it has left the bloodstream. By analyzing those traces, forensic scientists would be able to determine how and when Lita had been poisoned. And if they knew that, they'd have a better idea of who tried to kill her. At Texas A&M University, research chemist Dennis James uses a nuclear reactor to determine the precise amount of trace elements in a given sample. The process is called neutron activation analysis. Neutron activation analysis is capable of testing for a lot of different types of materials. Some of those are poisonous and some of those aren't. Uh, it is particularly sensitive to transition metals and some of the heavy metals in particular. Lita's hair was cut into six segments, each representing about a month of hair growth. By comparing the amount of arsenic in each segment, scientists could build a timeline showing when each dose was consumed and how much arsenic it contained. The canister containing the samples is shuttled to the core. There, it is exposed to nuclear energy for six hours, during which time some of the elements in the samples absorb subatomic particles and become unstable. Once removed from the reactor, the elements decay, losing the extra subatomic particles. As they do so, they emit a distinct burst of energy called a gamma ray. Using a gamma ray detector, technicians look for arsenic's signature emission. By comparing the readings from the hair snippets to that of the control samples, they can calculate the concentration of arsenic in each sample. Each snip of Lita Noble's hair, progressing from tips to scalp, showed an increasing amount of arsenic. Lita's dosage had gradually increased over at least six months. By administering moderate amounts of arsenic over that length of time, the killer had inadvertently given Lita a tolerance for the poison, which he tried to overcome with a whopping dosage shortly before Lita was hospitalized. The poison had been administered after Algie was buried. He couldn't have been the culprit, but he may have been a victim. Though Algie's hair was too short to tell scientists how long he'd been poisoned, tissue samples taken from his body showed that he, like his wife, endured a massive dose of arsenic. The toxin was found throughout his organs. Finding the poisoner wouldn't be as easy as finding the poison. Someone with access to the elderly couple had, over time, been administering toxic doses of arsenic into their food or drink. That meant that the murderer was probably someone close to the nobles. Someone they trusted. Investigators faced the delicate task of asking the victim's friends to point out who among them might be a poisoner. 
a neighbor had a suggestion. And this next door neighbor felt that a young man named Timothy Scoggin was a very likely suspect because he spent a lot of time in their home. New in town, Scoggin was a well-liked member of the San Angelo community. Best known for his skill as a porcelain painter and his willingness to help the town's senior citizens with errands and odd jobs. He was a mortician by trade, but appeared to be doing well in a series of business ventures. And he loved to make himself useful. Among the elderly people he helped were Lita and Algy Nobles. Shortly after befriending them, he had purchased their air conditioning business. Although he was chronically behind in his mortgage payments, Lita's faith in this surrogate son never wavered. After Algy's death, Lita had relied heavily on him. To Frazier, Scoggin fit the profile of a poisoner. First of all, he had motive. He owed the victims $100,000. Secondly, he had access to the noble's home. Finally, he had his victims' undying trust. After we suspected Timothy Scoggin, we went and talked to Mrs. Noble and interviewed her in the hospital room. She practically ran us out. She liked this guy. He was coming to the hospital room and, and doing her hair and doing her nails. But it wouldn't be long before Frazier could expose the greed beneath Scoggin's angelic demeanor. He learned that during the time of Lita's hospitalization, there had been a lot of suspicious activity in her bank account. While she lay in bed, nearly $48,000 in personal checks had been written to Tim Scoggin, suspicious for a woman who had no use of her hands. She has these rubber bands and braces on her hands and couldn't sign her name if she wanted to. So we passed those checks in front of her and asked her how she signed those. And that was enough to convince her that he was the one. But check forging doesn't prove homicide. If detectives were going to turn their suspicion into a murder charge, they'd need to know more about what made Tim Scoggin tick. A probe into his past convinced investigators that his penchant for poisoning didn't start with Lita and Algy Nobles. And it's very nice, sure. Investigators learned that before moving to San Angelo, Tim Scoggin had lived with two elderly sisters who had died suddenly within days of each other. Scoggin boasted he'd probably be inheriting a small fortune from these deceased aunts. Well, thank you very much. But the true story was far different than the version Scoggin had been spreading around town. They were not aunts. They weren't any kin to Timothy Scoggin. However, interestingly enough, he had been kind of a houseboy, an errand boy for them and had lived with them off and on for a long time. As he had done with the nobles, Scoggin endeared himself to Catherine and Cordelia Norton. Thought this might pick up your spirits a little bit. Just five weeks before Algy Noble succumbed, both sisters were dead. In February, Scoggin had taken Catherine Norton, a diabetic, to the hospital for a checkup after her surgery for cancer of the pancreas. Cordelia! When they returned home, Cordelia became violently ill. He quickly shuttled the older sister to the hospital. Scoggin and Catherine returned home and went to sleep. Thanks so much, and you have a good night. Scoggin stayed at the house in case Catherine needed anything. In the morning, Scoggin checked on Catherine and, finding her unresponsive, called her doctor. He pronounced Catherine dead. The next day, Cordelia died in her hospital bed. Both deaths were ruled natural causes. 
No, I think probably he's already... Six months after the deaths of the Norton sisters, investigators wanted to know if they, like the nobles, had been poisoned by arsenic. Problem was, Catherine and Cordelia Norton had been cremated. Investigators learned that Tim Scoggin had used his expertise as a mortician to destroy any evidence of foul play in the deaths of the Norton sisters. He used that knowledge to, to know how to forge orders for cremation, which he presented on both of these ladies and said that they had personally requested from him that they be cremated as soon as they had died, and they were promptly cremated and buried. Investigators now were faced with the task of detecting poison in ashes. No one had ever tried this before. If scientists could navigate this uncharted territory, they'd be one step closer to catching a murderer. The ashes of Cordelia and Catherine Norton were brought to the Texas Department of Public Safety Crime Laboratory, where toxicologist Rod McCutcheon was asked to analyze them chemically. He was initially doubtful about his chance of success. I really didn't think there would be much of a chance to find any poison in cremation remains. I'd never heard of anyone trying to do this. After reflecting a minute about the particular poison he was interested in, the arsenic, I realized that there was some possibility that the arsenic may still be present because it's an element, and an element will not change. To test for the presence of arsenic, McCutcheon placed the cremated remains in an acidic solution, then heated it. Impurities are burned away. If there is any arsenic, it remains in the liquid. Chemicals are added to turn the arsenic into a gas. It bubbles through a liquid, which turns purple in the presence of arsenic. The more arsenic in the sample, the more intense the color. The tests showed that Cordelia's remains contained lethal amounts of arsenic. Catherine's remains showed none. The negative findings in Catherine's ashes actually bolstered the case by serving as a control. Since both sisters had died on the same day and had been cremated in the same oven, the lack of arsenic in one of the samples proved that the ashes were not contaminated by the burning process. Neutron activation analysis confirmed the findings. Detectives began their pursuit of Scoggin by seeing if he had purchased arsenic. They visited the local grocery store. There's nobody in there, Can I help you? Uh, yeah. Are you the owner? Yes. Great. Here, Tim Scoggin's love of familiarity would strike against him. The clerk told detectives that he remembered Scoggin buying a large amount of rat poison shortly before any of the victims died. The primary ingredient of rat poison is arsenic. Investigators deduced that Scoggin had mixed the poison with products that he knew only his victims would eat, Algae's baby food and Lita's antacid. Since he regularly delivered their groceries, he could have mixed up the rat poison before bringing them over. To test their hunch, investigators searched the noble's cabinets and refrigerator. Most of the food had been thrown away, but a few of Lita's antacids were still around. A single bottle of the medicine tested positive for arsenic. Based on the scientific evidence, law enforcement was ready to take Tim Scoggin into custody. The real strong thing that made the case for us was the work done in the laboratories. Of course, there's no other way we would have ever found uh, arsenic in those ashes nor in the body of Mr. Nobles. And so the people who did the forensic work really are the ones who turned the crank in this case for us. We'd probably still be working on it if it hadn't been for them finding this heavy metal poison. Scoggin was arrested for the murder of Algie Nobles and the attempted murder of Lita. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. And even though there was no direct proof that he killed Catherine Norton, 
Investigators believe he tampered with her insulin dosage. He subsequently pleaded guilty to the murders of both sisters and was given two 50-year sentences. The horrifying truth is that poisoners often get away with their crimes, at least for a while. But vigilance and persistence are strong antidotes to a poisoner's toxic schemes. On November 1st, 1982, paramedics in St. Peter's, Missouri were summoned to the home of Lloyd and Shirley Allen. 40-year-old Lloyd Allen had been sick for months with an undiagnosed illness. That morning, his wife said, he became violently ill, then lost consciousness. The coroner believed that he died from natural causes, but he couldn't be sure. On the death certificate, cause of death remained blank. A few days later, Detective Robert Birding of the St. Charles County Sheriff's Department learned of a series of anonymous calls phoned into the local news station. Lloyd Allen hadn't died a natural death, the tipsters said. He'd been poisoned. A canvas of uh, Lloyd Allen's neighbors uh, was initiated, and it was subsequently learned that the anonymous phone calls uh, came from one or more of Lloyd's uh, neighbors. Detective Birding did a routine follow-up to see if the phone calls had any merit. Meantime, authorities prevented the body from being buried, pending investigation. Hi, ma'am. I'm Sergeant Birding of the St. Charles County Sheriff's. The neighbors told police that the timing of his illness was suspicious. Lloyd's health and behavior changed drastically after his new wife and her daughters moved in. To investigators, these neighborly observations didn't seem like much at first, hardly the kind of information to hang a murder investigation on. But they prompted police to ask more questions about the Allen family. Friends and neighbors told police that problems began shortly after Shirley and Lloyd married in the fall of 1981. Everyone was pleased that Lloyd, a sociable and generous man, had finally found the love and companionship he'd been looking his whole life for. It was his first marriage, but Shirley's fourth. After the wedding, Lloyd brought Shirley Allen and her two daughters 15-year-old Norma and 12-year-old Paula into his home. Now he had an instant family to banish the loneliness and a true soulmate in his new wife. Norma? 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 But winter brought stress and unhappiness to the family. Go on back to your room. Norma ran away from home several times and eventually landed in juvenile detention. The marriage grew strained. Then Lloyd started feeling sick. Lloyd went from doctor to doctor. None was able to relieve his symptoms or tell him what was wrong. He tried to work around the house and yard but was too weak to complete any of his projects. Detectives learned that Shirley tried to boost his stamina with an iron supplement drink, but it didn't help. As he grew sicker, Thanks. he began keeping him away from other people. Suspicions began to center around Lloyd's new wife. Drink some more. Uh, the neighbors related to us that uh, she was segregating him uh, from neighbors. He, uh, he wouldn't be seen out very much. Uh, he, wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't be able to acknowledge uh, their hellos and their, their, their gestures of greeting because uh, of, of his, his poor health. And it appeared to them that Shir Shirley was concealing uh, Lloyd. Then, finally, she cut him off entirely. A neighbor had come to pick up a wheelbarrow he loaned to Lloyd. Concerned about his friend's diminished health, he urged Lloyd to seek another doctor. The conversation was cut short when Shirley arrived. 
she ushered the neighbor out and later filed a trespassing complaint against him. Shirley's behavior seemed odd, but investigators couldn't hang a murder case on neighborhood gossip. Birding needed to discover a motive. He did. Shirley was the beneficiary of a $25,000 life policy. And we also learned that she was uh, the beneficiary of Lloyd's will, uh, which had recently been changed. It is only natural for a wife to be named as her husband's beneficiary. But it was the timing, not the payoff, that gave detectives pause. Uh, Lloyd's health began to decline just night. days after signing the papers. That was something time, to go uh, on, but not much. It didn't provide the kind of firm foundation detectives required to move forward. Birding hoped that an interview with the suspect would reveal something more, but he was met only with stock answers. Of, of course, she gave us uh, some exculpatory statements that uh, Lloyd Allen's uh, death was of natural causes. He's being treated by a variety of physicians for a, for a variety of illnesses that she described to us as, as depression. Uh, there was a, a litany of uh, medications in the home uh, that she said that he was uh, taking for his treatment. The fact remained that the victim had continued wasting away with no apparent cause and no evidence of disease. Mrs. Allen was still a suspect. She had motive and opportunity. But investigators had no clues, no witnesses, and no idea what killed Lloyd Allen. Lloyd Allen was dead, and detectives suspected he was poisoned by his wife. But they had no way of proving it. The investigation stalled. This is in regard to the death of Lloyd Allen. Then Wait, police got phone? a break when a witness came forward. I don't want to talk over the phone. Is it possible? Four days after Lloyd's house? death, Shirley's daughter Norma called the sheriff's department. She told them she was in possession yes. of the poison. The Norma backed up her story with some evidence. Inside a brown paper bag, detectives found a wine bottle filled with green liquid. On the label, a handwritten warning read, don't drink. A warning that Norma told police her mother asked her to write. Norma said she wasn't sure what was in the bottle, but she suspected it was antifreeze. She told investigators that over the last two months, she'd seen her mother giving the liquid to Lloyd. Norma also told police that she'd witnessed her mother mixing gas treatment with sugar and orange food coloring to simulate the iron supplement. On the day of his death, Norma said, Shirley poured him a dose of pure antifreeze and forced him to drink it. Maybe we should call a doctor. Guided by Norma's testimony, toxicologists tested the contents of the bottle for antifreeze. A sample of the liquid was injected into the gas chromatograph. The apparatus separates a compound into smaller chemicals so it can be analyzed. Each chemical is displayed as a peak on a graph. The resulting peak was a match for antifreeze known chemically as ethylene glycol. According to toxicologist Christopher Long of St. Louis University, antifreeze, with its sweet taste, is a subtle, stealthy killer. The victim might never even realize he's drinking himself to death. Antifreeze would produce something um, like having a drink of alcohol. Um, but as far as a burning sensation or anything to warn you, no, it wouldn't. So it'd be the same as if maybe if you had a little uh, taste of beer or something like that, only without the flavoring. So you might get just a slight change in how you feel, but nothing really noticeable. But over time, antifreeze is deadly. As it is metabolized by the body, it produces toxins that raise the acid level of the blood.
with each dose, Lloyd Allen's body and mind would slowly be destroyed. When your body chemistries change and your kidneys aren't working, it's not purifying your blood of the waste products. So that could, in fact, account for why he appeared uh, dizzy or a zombie-like or just plain dull. You know, his, his mind wasn't working properly. Because so many of Lloyd's organs were failing, it would have been difficult for any doctor to diagnose the poisoning. In the final stages, even if Lloyd knew that the woman he loved betrayed him with poison, he would have been too weak to protect himself and too confused to plead for help. Scientists determined that antifreeze poisoning was consistent with Lloyd Allen's mysterious ailment. To prove it, the body was autopsied and tissue samples were tested. His liver, kidneys, and brain contain crystals formed by the breakdown of massive quantities of ethylene glycol. It was consistent with long-term consumption of the liquid. The coroner ruled Lloyd's death a homicide by ethylene glycol poisoning. Detectives had found their poison now they had to be sure about the poisoner. Well, uh... Norma was a troubled teenager who'd been at odds with her mother for years. The possibility remained that she had poisoned Lloyd herself to frame her mother. After a series of interviews, that theory was quickly discounted. Norma was truly fond of the victim and had nothing to gain by his death. With the evidence in hand, police arrested Shirley Allen. They were able easily to construct their case against her. A $25,000 life insurance policy gave her the motive to kill her husband. The spiked wine bottle gave her the means. In a trial that lasted only four days, she was found guilty of killing Lloyd Allen. Shirley Allen was sentenced to life with no parole for 50 years. She died in prison. Without the forensics evidence uh, and learning that actually uh, Lloyd Allen's body contained ethyl glycol, we would not have had uh, a homicide investigation. We would not have learned of his death as being a homicide, and Shirley Allen most likely would have gotten away with his death. Because of the concern of Lloyd Allen's neighbors, a cunning murderer was brought to justice. It wasn't the only time a crime was exposed when nosy neighbors smelled trouble. It was a summer evening in 1980 when David Davis sped to his neighbor's hey, house in Hillsdale, Michigan, pleading for Quick assistance. Davis told his neighbor that he and Shannon, his wife of 10 months, had been riding when her horse reared, sending her tumbling. She had struck her head on a large rock. Injured, but still conscious, she sent him for help. The men arrived to find Shannon Davis unresponsive. Her head was bleeding. Her skin had a bluish cast. they rushed her to the hospital. When she arrived, she had no pulse and her pupils were fixed and dilated. Technicians attempted to resuscitate her, but failed. Doctors determined that she had died of a head injury from the fall. Case closed. not for long. Two months later, the incident came to the attention of Michigan State Police Detective Don Brooks. Brooks had heard that Davis's neighbor had refused to let the case die. The death was ruled to be an accident, but the circumstances were such that uh, he felt this was probably a murder case. Suspicion took root in the neighbor's mind the day after the death when he revisited the scene. 
he noticed that the branches of a nearby tree were marred by two circular bruises, suggesting that horses had been tied there. A fresh pile of manure sat six feet away, confirming that impression. It appeared that the Davises, the only riders in the area, had stopped here long enough to tie their horses. That didn't fit with Davis's story about the victim's horse bolting and his mad rush to find help. The neighbor, Dick Britton, was also a family friend. But he grew concerned that Davis was hiding something. First, I felt guilty thinking that way. I kept thinking, well, I got to be wrong. You know, but, it, you know, it, it, this went on for quite a while, and you just keep thinking, and, and things just didn't add up, didn't make sense. Shannon and David had been married for only 10 months before the accident, wed after only a seven-week courtship. It was love at first sight. After their marriage, Shannon came to live on Davis's farm. He taught her how to ride. To Britton and the victim's family, the account Davis had given didn't fit with the way he'd seen Shannon riding just minutes before the accident. She was a cautious rider with a quiet horse. Shannon's parents really didn't know much about their son-in-law, except that he made their daughter happier than they'd ever seen her. After the accident, the victim's parents had clashed with Davis. He wanted to have his wife cremated. Cremated? No way. Hey, listen. They insisted on burial, and so Shannon was buried. And there's a double indemnity. At the hospital, Davis told Shannon's family that he had no life insurance for her. The other will benefit by receiving the other. Honey, don't you think that's a little too much? But they learned that weeks before her death, the newlyweds had signed a policy. I have a contract for each of you to Now Davis was preparing to collect on it. With double indemnity for accidental death, Davis stood to gain more than $300,000. The family believed that provided 300,000 reasons for Davis to plan a murder. To investigators, it merely looked like a grieving family trying to blame a tragic accident on the victim's new husband. The meddling neighbor was helping to stir them up. Fueled by their suspicions, Shannon's family and Britain urged authorities to reopen the case. One month after her death, the victim's body was exhumed. The examination clearly showed a fatal brain injury and bruises consistent with a fall from a horse. A routine drug screen was also conducted, but the physical damage was so compelling that the case was closed a second time, even before the drug screen was completed. Britain and the family would not let the matter rest. Hey, Mr. Britton, Don yes. Brooks in the state, please. Oh, glad to come. The Detroit Free Press published an article on their suspicions surrounding their daughter's death. Okay. It prompted the state attorney's office to get involved. Don Brooks handled the case. I, I thought to myself, if 50% of this article is accurate, uh, there's a great deal of information to go on, and, and it's going to be very helpful, and uh, it sure leads one to believe that this is a murder case, not an accident. For Brooks, the capstone of Britain's argument involved the rock which ended the victim's life. It was the only one in the area. It might have been a freak coincidence that she happened to hit her head on it. But in light of the other evidence, this small detail raised big questions. Uh, the, the percentage of someone falling off from a horse in that area and happened to hit their head on the only rock around was so high that uh, that itself would, would should raise a lot of questions. The closer Brooks looked into the death, the more suspicious he became. 
He sought the results of the drug screen from the autopsy and learned that it too raised some difficult questions. It was time to seek answers. In the lab, a tissue sample from the autopsy was analyzed by a gas chromatograph. Every substance creates its own peak of a specific length at a specific point. These peaks are called the retention time of the substance. The chromatograph showed a strange chemical in the victim's tissue that matched nothing in the lab's database. No one knew what it was. But before they could pursue it, the case was closed again, and the mystery was buried with the victim. Still convinced that Shannon was murdered, her family pinned their hopes on this mysterious peak, pressuring investigators to study it further. Technicians toiled for weeks, but couldn't identify the compound. They ruled out instrument error. They simulated the conditions of embalming and burial on sample tissues to see if the victim's tissue was contaminated after death. No matter what they did, they couldn't isolate the chemical. All they knew was that there was something in the victim's body that shouldn't have been there. And they had no idea what it was. Four months after the tragic horseback riding fall that ended Shannon Davis's life, grave suspicions swirled around the so-called accident. Based on the questionable crime scene, the insurance money, and the curious lab results, Brooks was convinced that foul play was involved in the victim's death. Now he had to prove it. You put it all together and it was, it was very obvious to me that this was a, was a murder case. He set his crosshairs on the victim's husband, David Davis. But Davis had moved to Florida. Investigators had no choice but to watch him go. Though the circumstantial evidence was heaped against him, there was no solid proof that he lied about the accident. Even if I received a confession from Dave Davis, uh, we still had the problem with uh, the autopsy saying that those injuries were consistent with falling off from a horse, striking the head, and the cause of death was the injury to the, uh, to the brain. So that became the challenge of the medical community at that point. The case teetered on the mysterious chemical peak. Uncovering its relationship, if any, to the victim's death was the last chance detectives had to foil what might otherwise prove to be the perfect crime. Unable to determine what the compound was, Brooks reviewed the other facts of the crime. What he couldn't figure out was how the victim could have been unlucky enough to have struck that solitary rock. Brooks mulled various scenarios over with his colleagues, but none seemed to work. Then, a moment of inspiration struck, revealing a scheme that would tie up all the loose ends and explain the mystery chemical. If this young lady was paralyzed in some way, you know, her muscular system, her, her um, nervous system was paralyzed in such a way where she couldn't resist and he could create the injury he wanted. Investigators believed that the victim was immobilized before her head was intentionally struck against the rock. They began searching for a chemical that would fit a killer's criteria. A drug that could immobilize quickly, then leave little trace. It would also have to be easy to obtain without rousing suspicion. What could it be, and where would they find it? Since Davis lived on a farm, it was likely that he had access to compounds designed for animals. Detectives interviewed one of the vets employed by Davis. He described a litany of sedatives and tranquilizers. Among them was a drug that seemed a likely candidate. Succinylcholine is a powerful muscle relaxant. In humans, it can paralyze the respiratory system in seconds. 
Because it breaks down into chemicals naturally found in the body, SCH is considered a nearly perfect murder weapon, one that wouldn't show up in a gas chromatograph. At Brooks's request, toxicologist Tom Carroll of the Medical College of Ohio tested it anyway. So I immediately went over to our pharmacy, got some succinylcholine, and was able to put it onto the gas chromatograph, and it had the exact same retention time as our unknown peak. Bingo, we thought we had something. To confirm the results, the chromatograph was recalibrated and the SCH retested a total of five well, times. Each time, the results were identical. But for absolute confirmation, the tissue samples had to be tested on the more sensitive mass spectrometer to see if the chemical could be isolated that way. The samples were sent to two labs for fine-tuned analysis. Unfortunately, neither of the mass spectrometers could distinguish the chemical in the victim's tissues. Carol took the SCH and the tissue samples to Stockholm, Sweden, where scientists were experimenting with methods to analyze chemicals very similar to SCH. Shannon's tissues were tested in the spectrometer there. The initial results were disappointing. Test after test failed to reveal the chemical. If they couldn't find it, then Davis would have committed the perfect crime. Carol wouldn't allow that to happen. Investigators pressed on. The precision that made the spectrometer so sensitive also made it temperamental. After scores of attempts, a tiny adjustment to the temperature of the equipment brought hard-won success. Boom, we had found it. And I mean, you talk about a celebration. This, this was some hooping and hollering that you never believed. From there on out, it was simply a matter of doing more extractions, getting all the data necessary. We were now able to identify it in the tissues. Now, investigators had to determine how the chemical was introduced into the victim's body. More than a year after her death, the victim was re-exhumed and a new autopsy performed to look for a likely site of injection. It revealed extensive bruising on the left. These injuries told of a hard fall. The right side was uninjured, except for two curious marks, one on her shoulder, one on her wrist. These two bruises represented the faint tracks of a killer's needle. They had been overlooked before because no one suspected that a needle was used in the crime. As investigators prepared their findings, they thought their long struggle was over. Scientists in Sweden thought they'd found the weapon that killed Shannon Davis in Michigan. Through sheer diligence, they perfected a way to isolate traces of deadly SCH from human tissue. The jubilant team told investigators that they could now arrest the suspect, David Davis. We told, us, we told Don Brooks, and we told him back there, we got it, get him. Uh-uh, can't do that. The method has not been scientifically evaluated yet. The success of their test relied on an experimental method for preparing the tissue sample. Before a new forensic technique can be accepted in the courtroom, other scientists must evaluate it. The process can take years. But because of the gravity of the case, Carroll's findings were reviewed and published in a matter of weeks. Scientists had successfully proven that SCH had a role in the death of Shannon Davis. Brooks's theory had proved correct. According to the prosecution scenario, Davis set out to kill his wife on their way home from the Britons. He tied the horses, then went after Shannon with a syringe, injecting her twice with the lethal drug.
for that second injection site to be delivered, she would probably have had to have been paralyzed at that point because it was precisely right on the vein. This bruise up here was probably as a result of the struggle while he's injecting her, while she still had some life in her. And um, that's how I think, you know, once she goes to the down the ground and collapses, uh, then he can pick her up and drop her onto this rock, and that will create the effect of falling from the horse. It was a cleverly thought out plan, undone by the scientific method. Davis staged what he thought was the perfect crime. The only problem was the perfect murder weapon was no longer so perfect. David Davis was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life without parole. Brooks suspected that Shannon Davis wasn't the first person whose death by SCH poisoning was overlooked. But because of this case, hopefully, she's one of the last. And so to, to be a part of an investigation like this where the medical field basically, uh, or the information about succinodicolene in the medical field has been rewritten, uh, that's kind of a nice thing to be, to be a part of. It's impossible to know how many more victims have been killed silently by people they trusted. Poisoners may never lay a hand on their victims, but with advancing forensics techniques, it's getting harder to escape without leaving a print.